This is Corey Willis with PBI, and you're listening to The Diesel Podcast. I'm Adam Blattenberg from Diesel World. Hi, I'm Clint Cannon from APS. This is Dan, owner of Dan's Diesel Performance. I'm Cass from Diesel Doctor of Tennessee, and you're listening to The Diesel Podcast. What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today. You're going to be chatting with Bulletproof Diesel. So they specialize in power stroke upgrades and, and performance. Adam Blattenberg from Diesel World Magazine is going to be chatting with them, and he chatted with them at SEMA. So they're going to go over SEMA and diesel performance and racing and tons of different things. So we know you guys are going to love this episode. Before we get to it, we want to thank our sponsors who help make episodes like this possible. It's Diesel Doctor of Tennessee, Precision Industries, Dan's Diesel Performance, Truck Porn, Diesel Crate, PPI, BD Diesel, Amsoil, Nasty Truck Network, Diesel World Magazine, ATS Diesel, Magnolia Diesel Performance, and Optilube. So if you guys are looking for upgrades, have product questions, build questions, make sure and check out our sponsors. Give them a call or send them an email. They're more than happy to help you. All right, let's get to the podcast with Bulletproof Diesel. All right, everybody. We're here at SEMA 2018. We're here with the guys from Bulletproof Diesel. Howdy. We got Jeff Delenn and Gene Neal. Hey, Adam. Uh, these guys have been buddies of mine for years. Uh, just wanted to see uh, what you guys thought about the show. You guys got in uh, what, yesterday morning, or sorry, yeah. this morning. Yeah. Yeah, the show so far. You know, one of the things I saw that was kind of interesting to me was, and maybe you saw this too, Gene, up in the Ford booth, there's a support truck, you know, a, a, a Super Duty that's built with a service bed, but the service bed unfolds they have drawers of tools that pull out and everything and it's all actuated and I really really like it and uh, the general manager of Bulletproof Diesel and uh, Andrew and I saw it we said it's really cool but that lasts about 10 minutes in Baja you know yeah. all of those motors and servos would just get beat to hell and, and so it was really cool seeing that and, I, and I, would, I think it's a really cool truck it looks like a transformer it almost does. kind of on the bed yeah, yeah. it's yeah. cool so for everyone that doesn't know um the Bulletproof guys, you guys are really involved in off-road racing. Correct. So that's you know that's your mindset sometimes is looking at those things if it will not survive exactly. a thousand miles in the dirt getting beat up. I mean that's how we test a lot of our products. You know, tested yeah. Baja. Jeans brought our products up to Alaska, which is something. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. in the winter time. In the winter time. Yeah. In the winter. And yeah, parts really get chewed up and spit out. And so uh, as cool as some of the stuff is, you know you. You have to wonder if it would survive down there, stuff we've seen at the show. Well, I think it's fair to set the table, because when we go down to the Baja, we don't just go down to a beach and sit on a beach. We help support Cameron Steel and the Desert Assassins Racing Associate, our racing team, and they'll do like the Baja 1000, and about every third year, they go all the way from Ensenada, which is up by San Diego, all the way down to the tip in Cabo. And that race, they run that race in about 24 hours for the fastest trucks. Rip to the tip? Well, that's a motorcycle thing. Sorry, okay. But they'll do the Baja 1000. Sometimes they just do a big loop out of Ensenada, starts and ends. But sometimes they go all the way down to the end, and you have to have support trucks all the way down there. You can't service it at pit one and then beat them to pit three. Those guys will run 1,000 miles in 20 hours, 24 hours. They average 60 miles an hour. So our trucks have to get back in there in those remote places with a bunch of fuel, tires, tools, air guns, jacks, crew. And so... Everything just gets beat to snot getting back in there. There's no smooth roads. Even the paved roads are rough in Baja, let alone the off-road. And so that's why it's important because Bulletproof Diesel, that's our mindset. If it won't last there, it's not good enough for your truck, for right. your products. That's kind of our whole mindset that defines us. When you guys just built a new Chase truck um, that is in the February issue of Diesel World, um, out on stands, I'm so glad. Yeah. Are, you, are you used to magazines, Jeff? Yeah. yeah, right. Well, Ken's also been asking me about every day when the, when the <laughs> article's going to come out of the change truck, so yeah, I have it memorized. Day. He's really yeah. excited for it. But yeah, it's uh, we really tried to build a next level change truck. We've got experience in building change trucks, and we've got a few of them that, have, that we've used in past years. And experience the, actually chasing. Chasing yeah, as well. Yeah. yeah. But to take a 2018 truck with all the current technology and, and put all the cool stuff that's out now on your was really kind of the goal for this one, a next level kind of uh, flagship chase truck for us. Well, and it's been out already, right? It has, indeed. Yeah. And, and so it, it's, it's really a cool truck, I've got to say. I mean, it's got Fox coilovers on the front, uh, EDS suspension. Uh, we did 
custom beavers on the back. Nice. Uh, you know, re remote reservoir shocks and bump stops everywhere. So uh, it can really take those roads pretty quick. And it's got a service body on it, which means it's heavy. Indeed. How much yeah. fuel? How much fuel do you carry for the, the trucks? So uh, the I think the the onboard fuel tank is, is 50 gallons, and then he did okay. two additional 50 gallon transfer tanks up in the bed, each so, with its own spout. Is that 1,200 pounds of fuel? Uh, 150 times six, so yeah. Is it six pounds? That was eight. Six okay. pounds. Uh, water's eight pounds a gallon. Fuel's okay. six, six and a really half. Really, fuel's lighter than water? Yeah, floats, I didn't know right? That. Yeah, floats, floats on water. water. Good point. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Got to know these things. All right. Yeah. <laughs> he went to engineering school. So nine. Yeah. What, what is that? Nine hundred pounds. Yeah. 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 If I can't do math, this is going to look real bad on. I did. I was okay. under the impression there would not be math on the quiz. So right. Or, okay. Yeah. okay. But so nine hundred pounds of fuel. Call it a thousand. Yeah. Few, a few hundred pounds of tire, indeed. Yeah. Uh, at least. Yeah. What's a tire weigh? Hundred pounds? Eighty pounds? So yeah. So with wheels. And four hundred pounds, maybe. Uh, Running what? Four spares in that. In the uh, at least truck? two. To, yeah. Okay. At least yeah. two at all times, and then plus all the tools, you know, exactly. jacks and, and all that kind of stuff. We've got the trophy jack, which we produce now, which is a pneumatically powered jack. Okay. Um, it's, it really is, is meant for CO, CO2 rather than like an air compressor. Right. So if you have a CO2 tank, uh, you, just, you just hit that lever and it has an airbag that comes up, kind of like the airbag on the back of the truck. Yeah. And so uh, it's been great for desert racers. It's got big old knobby you know, tires on it. They can slide it right under there, hit that lever, and the trophy truck comes right up. Is it real wide, I'm assuming, for stability? Or? Uh, it's not as wide as you might think. It, it, it resembles a normal jack, but just a little bigger, a little longer. Yeah. And... Uh, with a, with a big metal footprint, so it sits on the sand and the dust. It doesn't sink. It doesn't sink in. Big course. skid plate underneath it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's got to lift them pretty far. I mean, if you've got a trophy truck with three feet of travel, you got to pick that thing at least a foot and a half up off the ground. Yeah, unless you're picking it up from the from the pumpkin. We pick it up at the axle. Yeah. I'm sorry, of course. Yeah, yeah. From the differential. But there are there are situations where you need to pick the truck up from other places. So you're yeah. you're not you're not wrong. There. It's a yeah. lot of travel. Yeah. True. It's a lot of travel. Well, one of the cool things, though, if we could cross-promote a minute, is when we go to the Baja, we have all the stuff, like you're saying, in the bed of the truck. And a lot of guys use E-Track or A-Track to hold it in place. And we've got a guy named Kenny that works with us, and Kenny invented this thing. We call it Kenny Track from is a shorthand inside the shop. But it's called, uh, we call it Handy Track, Hand and then Eve Track. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, it's a patented device that goes in E-Track that it's a rigid mount. So it's you don't have a... A strap that's going along trying to hold that tire or it's jack a or nice point for e -track. It's a bolt-on point for e-track. Yeah. It's the only thing like it in the world. Which is so strange. Don't you think it's strange that no one had invented that yet? I, yeah, I do. It blew my mind. I do, actually. Well, there's all sorts of tie-downs and all that, but if you wanted to actually, take a race jack or something and build a bolt-on mount for exactly. it and your trailer already has e-track, you're set. You're We've seen guys like toolboxes. You want them to secure it down in Mexico. So they can put it up there, drill some holes, mount it up to that, and then they can lock the toolbox, yeah. and they can't pick it up and carry it away. There's no straps to cut and right. lock away. It's rigidly mounted to the bed, and you want to move it out, take it out, put it in something else, five minutes and you're out. It's easy. It's, it's really easy. cool. So the service body truck in Ford's booth was your favorite. <laughs> well, that, that was the thing I think we talked about the most, because we were, we were talking about the pros of it, the cons on it, yeah. if it would work, if it wouldn't work, stuff like that. Gene and I also uh, took a minute to stop and look at the Ranger, and I don't know if the diesel is going to be uh, available in the United States immediately for the new Ranger, but I think it's probably in the works at some point. No, it's, it is going to be available. I is don't it? know if, I, I can't remember off the top of my head if it's immediately. What size engine is that going to be, the diesel? Is that like three liter? Two, eight, I think. Okay. Is international? I can't remember for sure. I haven't, I haven't, uh, you're the guy that would know. I farm the OEM stuff out a little bit. Oh, okay. You know, Tell well, Gene and I were both saying that the Ranger looks pretty cool. You yeah, know, they, like they did a decent job with it, we think. I wish we get a diesel Raptor here. Well, I, so I was talking but. to Gene about this. I think what's going to happen is they're saying there is going to be no Raptor uh, because they don't want to cannibalize in the Ranger sales. you're right. talking about. Yeah. I'm saying a diesel. I know, I know. I know. But we'll see if our well, we were diesel Well, we were texting Raptor. about this uh, yeah. a few days ago or weeks ago, whatever it was. But it makes sense. They don't want to cannibalize the yeah. big truck market. And for the U.S., it is a larger truck market, I think you start going overseas, it's not as much of a large truck market, it's the small trucks. Like, uh, I was in Australia six years ago, I think, it was all Rangers. Yeah. Costa Rangers. Rica, there's not a full-sized car yeah. anywhere. <laughs> there was a few Super Duties down there, but I mean, yeah. a few, you know. 
the rare birds. And I really yeah. think the reason that Ford's not going to do the Ranger Raptor in the United States immediately is because they want people to get excited about the regular Ranger first. Of course. You know, they don't want people yeah. to be waiting for the for the Raptor version. So right. I think what they've done is announced that there is going to be no Raptor in the interim. But I wouldn't be the least bit surprised within 24 months if we see a, a, a Ranger Raptor come to the U.S. market. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. But, but that was so the Ranger and the, we, I guess we're just talking about Fords right now, huh? Yeah. yeah. But they've well, got an impressive fine. lineup up there. It yeah. looks good. Yeah. I like them. They always have a pretty pretty interesting booth. And it's always cool to see the GT cars, you know? Yeah. Ford GT. Oh, yeah. I was telling Gene, I think that's the most universally respected car. Because domestic guys like it. It's a Ford. Uh, the European crowd likes it. It's one Le Mans. You know, yeah. it's a, it's a yeah. supercar. So uh, in, in different circles of, of, of cars, that's the most respected. I've never seen a single model yet. Did you see the black dually they had with the TV that popped up out of the back? Is that the one with the, uh, uh, the copper tailgate? wheels on it? Yeah, the yeah. copper one, yeah. It's like it. an 80-inch TV or something <laughs> that just popped up out of the back. I guess. Everybody has to have that. That's a standard feature now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Go, Is go. that the one that's for the tailgating option that they have? Yeah, like the speakers yeah, I and think such? so. There you yeah. Go. yeah, I... I hate, hate to say it, I have not walked the show yet other than going from meeting to meeting. That's my day tomorrow. So I, I walked past it, looked at it, just went, what the heck is that? And kept going. You know, <laughs> that's, but, hey, that's how it goes when you're busy at SEMA. I know that. Yeah. That's, that's for sure. That's yeah, for sure. sure. Yeah. Well, it's 18 years for me. How many years for you? About I think same. this would be 16 for me. 16? Yeah, yeah, you got me beat. Yeah. I thought you had me beat. So. But how many years for you? I'm the new guy. Only 10 or 12. Yeah, I think, so. yeah. 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 Still enough to where you're used to it and you're not walking around with your jaw on the floor anymore. I remember my first year here, it was just, yep. Yep. I was, I, I lost my mind. Yeah. And I was just a little truck, you know, kid that loved trucks and walked in here. And, and that would have been right when big wheels were getting popular and yep. stuff like that. So yeah, I remember coming here and being like, oh my gosh, 22 inch wheels, I can't believe it. Yeah. There was, I think they were, I think they were actually 30s. Just a fake wheel. It had to be fake, <laughs> and they probably wrapped it with like you know black cloth to make it look like tire. Yeah. I remember it was on an H1. Um, so what are those things? Eight thousand pounds at the, the lightest they possibly yeah. were, yeah. but it was chrome spoke. And I'm looking at it going, <laughs> there is no way those wheels will hold that vehicle up. I go and look behind it. There's a jack stand wrapped in black Unbelievable. cloth, so no one can see it. Wow. It was sitting on four jack stands on Not 30 weight bearing wheels. Yep. Well, yeah. if you can sell those, you know, yeah. the power to that guy. This year, there's actually 30s out there. You yeah. guys see the 30 inch? Yeah. No. Yeah. I, no. I, I have not seen any with tire on it yet. But they're going to make a tire service that rides around on the chrome yeah. on the 30s. It's we'll good for 10 miles. Yeah. It's basically going to do that anyway. Yeah, seriously. You know, that's going to be the return of the donk. I had 25 series tires on a vehicle once and I'll never do it again. Just too yeah. thin, just band-aids like around a wheel. I bent wheels like you wouldn't believe. The worst was when it would rain and you'd drive across a puddle, or when you thought it was a puddle, but really it was a puddle, you know? Mm. So there goes your wheel. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Was that your old uh, 7 Series BMW? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. now you're a BMW driver. How are you liking your diesel BMW? I yeah. love that thing. Yeah? A little 335D And you diesel. took it to the drag strip. Yeah, I, I had to take it just to see what it would do. It ran a 14.2. That's not bad. Um, not bad. Yeah. yeah, that's not bad. Um, trap speed was low. I want to say it was like 79. Huh. Takes um, a while to spool up, maybe? No, it takes off hard. Does it, really? And yeah. then it kind of falls on its face. Uh -huh. But uh, it's 200 horse at the wheels right now. It'll be 400 around March. we got got some stuff on order for it. Now, pardon me for not knowing the BMW diesel system better, but is it is it common rail? Yeah. Direct injection? Yeah, yeah. it's common rail. Um, it is uh, compound turbo. Oh, wow, cool. Two little tiny. One in front of the other? I can't remember the size. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah compound. Um, yeah, I mean, it spools up real quick. I've got a lot of low-end torque. That's um, great. It's, huh. Having fun in that thing, huh? It's fun. You know, and that's, that's why I bought it. Is, is I, bought, you know, I buy vehicles for the engines. You know, I wanted a it's an engine with a vehicle attached. Yeah, and it's, yeah. but it's a luxury. Sometimes. It's a luxury vehicle attached yeah. to it. And I never thought I'd be a, a car guy, but it's been fun carving canyons with it. And, you know, hey, when you live in Southern California, you know it's sure nice to have some people zip around in. You know, you and I have driven nothing but giant trucks, and you know it's hard yep. to park them because yep. parking spots in LA aren't made for them and yep. stuff like that. Yeah. So. In fact, as an Arizona guy, when I go to Southern Cal, I go. Probably going to be a parking garage yeah. in my future. I better get something lower than four feet, yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. I know every parking garage I can get to. You know, <laughs> All six with, of with them my, in Southern Cal? Yeah, with my 7.3, <laughs> there's only a few that I can actually fit in. You know, that reminds me, I used to know every uh, bathroom on the way to work in case I had to make an emergency <laughs> stop, <laughs> which happened. 
Well, so. you know, you're driving the diesel now, and they got a car, but Jeff, we got him into a six-liter for the yeah. first time. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. King's that's... Ranch, and I'd be curious to know what you think, Jeff. And I'm loving it. I, I tell you, I bought the truck kind of to be a, uh, a, a utility truck to tow my 4 by 4 and stuff, and I daily drive it now, and I love it. I really, really like the truck. King more Ranch, than. right? King Ranch, a 2006 okay. F-350, a one-ton, and uh, it's, uh, it's a white truck, tan highlights, nothing too flashy on it. Um, we did a video series uh, that you guys, Diesel World, uh, hosted for us. We did five parts to it, kind of correcting the five pattern failures that we find. In these are up on our YouTube and our Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Still, as well as yours as well. And we got a lot of great feedback on it, so people yeah. really appreciated it. But we went through the kind of the five big things that we talk about in the six liter engine. So that and this truck needed it all. It, it did. Was, it came really. in real hammered and it was smoke and white white smoke out the back. It had it. the head gaskets had holes in them like crazy. Yeah. Swiss so when I was hired, I said, what is this truck? And they said, oh, we're going to use that for something, maybe some videos or something like that. And I, I kind of always had my eye on it, too. Like, yeah, you know what? Maybe when that thing's running right off, I'll see if they'll sell it to me. And uh, long story short, that's what happened. But but it took a while to get there. So first, we we, we uh, removed the stock oil cooler, because that's really a source of so many problems. Right. Things, you know, plugs up with that coolant debris, and then the coolant can't get past it. So the EGR cooler gets hot and ruptures. And, all kinds of stuff. So Oil temps go crazy. Yeah. Turns your cold into Play-Doh, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. But to fix it, and that's the big part, to fix it, you have to pull the cap off. Indeed. Well, the, you, can, you can do it without pulling the, the cap off. The oil cooler, you don't have to, yeah. It's certainly easier to have more elbow room to yeah. pull the cap. Yeah, but we've seen videos. In fact, I was just watching one. Uh, a guy did it outdoors, uh, in, in, up in the northwest somewhere, and did the whole oil cooler kit outdoors. He did a time lapse of it. Oh, did it's he? Really something, oh, yeah. Wow. He had a cover over it in case it rained, like a tarp cover and yeah. stuff. But wow. I mean, that guy's going for it. He didn't stud it at the same time, did he? Probably not. I can't imagine he took the yeah. top end. Do you think they'll yeah. have to jack the uh, the cab up just a couple inches to get like the last two studs out? Yeah, maybe. To do it right, you need to pull the the, the, the cab. Yeah. Basically, and I know there's five million mechanics who just said, no, you don't, and that kind of stuff. But you know, for our standards of Boulder, we want to make sure that torque wrench swings perfectly every time. Right. It's not. Was that a click or did it hit the you know the degas bottle or something? We yeah. want to make sure it's perfect. Is it and my so that's elbow what we or did it do. actually click? Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I'm getting artritis? old. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. We, that's what we do. But I'm sure you could get around it and if you had to. You could, but right. we don't. So we did our, our full bulletproof oil cooler kit in it. So um, replaced, re relocated the oil cooler in, in, into a totally different style, which we do, which is almost like a radiator style, air so to oil. Air to oil. Okay. Yeah. All right. uh, up here at the front of the truck. We also did the bypass oil filtering, which is nice. It just keeps your oil that much cleaner. Right. The AMS oil filter on the, on the other side of the, the engine compartment. Big massive um, filter gets rid of. I know the stock filtration has an issue with the bypass on it, where what is it? It doesn't filter. It bypasses the filter altogether if you use the wrong filter. Can't yeah, on the correctly. factory. On just to be clear, on a six liter oil filter, it's a cartridge style. Right. And then uh, you thread the little cap off on the top to lift it up to pull the filter out. And what happens is when you lift that up, Ford doesn't want you to have a bunch of oil on the filter, so they put a little drain valve at the bottom. Yeah. Um, so when you lift it up, it drains the oil out of that reservoir back to the crankcase. We've seen a couple issues. One of us, that little drain valve is made out of about 37 cents worth of plastic and spring, and it likes to break. And so it'll be broken, and you won't know it. It's just an oily, gooky mess down there. Nobody knows what to look for, but we find them broken fairly routinely. Um, that's one of the problems. The other problem is, is there's a little bypass valve like you're talking about on the top. That it's designed if your filter gets so plugged up, it'll still feed oil to the engine. It'll just feed it dirty oil instead of, instead of clean oil. Right. Hey, welcome to SEMA. So yeah. the, uh, <laughs> come on through. So uh, it just filled, so that little bypass valve is made out of about 47 cents worth of plastic in spring, and we see those juxtaposed or put in there incorrectly all the time, or yeah, askew is probably the better word. Right. So oil is just bypassing your filter all day right yeah. to your engine and shortchanging your injectors and everything else. So. Beating up your injectors, beating up your turbo. For that two, those two reasons, that's why we get rid of those two things. We go to a spin on oil filter. It's what you see is what you get. Keep right. it simple, and it's just works super well. It's it's the filter that everyone's that everyone's been using for years, not the new cartridge style. Stick. Yeah, it works. It's yeah. Holds a couple quarts more, or holds a quart more, or something like that. Uh, a couple, two or three. Is yeah. it that many? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. For the first fill up, it'll hold quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. 
So, so you guys studded it? Yeah, yeah. we studded it. They ARP had studs on that because, you know, the 6-liter really doesn't have enough head bolts in the factory to hold those, those cylinder heads to the block. Because it has, what, 10, right? 10. And the 7.3 has... At least 12, I think. 16, 16? I think. Yeah, it's more. I can't remember exactly. What is it? Uh, essentially two per cylinder on the, uh, the 60? It's 10 on a 6 liter. But so it's a little bit exactly more. Right. And then, yes, uh, it's more It's more substantial. There's more of them around you. A 7.3 uses significantly more. It's like 16 or 18 per head. Right. So. But I tell you, that the head studs sure solve the problem. I've not heard of anyone having a big problem with the ARP head studs. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty... Bulletproof, as it were, part. You know? It's a great product. Yeah. Works well. Yep. Then from there, we did the, the EGR cooler, uh, which is kind of what people know us for, I think. Right. Bulletproof EGR cooler. Now the six-liter uh, EGR coolers have H-core technology, in them, which is a uh, just pretty slick. Yeah, it's really something. I've seen this stuff. So it's easy to explain too, which is nice. So you can imagine. Wait, if Jeff can explain it, anybody yeah. can get it. I yeah. like this. Let's hear it. So if you can imagine <laughs> an EGR cooler, uh, a factory one. Uh, inside, it's, it's kind of thin passageways, like a radiator. Yep. And so, uh, everything usually works fine with EGR coolers until there's maybe not as much coolant getting to it as it should. Right. So, if a, a, a EGR cooler is laying horizontal and, and coolant only bathes, say, fills up half of it with coolant, that upper half, it's not getting bathed with coolant, it'll start expanding, it's heat expansion, right. and it'll push the end plates the, just apart until they rupture. They and separate. Then, yeah. And then you'll get, you know, coolant, the exhaust, and vice versa. Right. Like that. We had originally found that uh, a much better way uh, for some of these DTR coolers is straight tubes. And the straight tubes work fantastic up to a certain length. And then with some of like the semi trucks, the big stuff, we found that there's even a better way to do it than straight tubes with some of the, the larger DTR coolers. And, and what Ken, uh, Gene's brother, well, did. Because of heat cycling. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. They see an enormous amount of heat cycling. So Ken thought, well, hey, rather than putting straight tubes in there, what if we put in tubes that were braided, almost like yeah. a, a braid you'd see in hair, like a French braid or something. But right. that way, instead of only expanding laterally, they can expand medially too. Right. And uh, there's room, for, there's four times less force in the testing that, that we paid to have done at, at the end point uh, than, a, than an OE style. So here. if you would think, okay, so when things get hot and cold, they hot, they expand, cold, they shrink. Yes. One long tube is going to expand laterally, straight up. You run this like I know this is not a coil spring, but for to it resembles to a spring. It, a little it, bit it is a coil spring. It's just not yeah. a very it's very not, high helix number. Yeah. yeah. It's very high so angle. if you had a coil spring inside there and it heats up, it's going to expand not so much laterally, but more around itself, exactly. which means it's not going to push the end caps exactly. off of the cooler. It That's reduces the stress. Yeah. Yeah. By a factor of four. Right. So Gene's been around the world and he's got it patented in how many countries now? Yeah. Uh, every place but China, basically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so are you actually having to travel around to do this? No, we have. Yeah. No. He lets his fingers do the walking. Yeah, yeah the patent ahead. attorneys have filed it all over Europe and Australia and yeah, all Wait, Korea. Can, you, can we back up and make up a different story and say that you went to every single place? Absolutely. <laughs> I had to travel to all of them and yeah. I had to get I had to get him out of prison in Indonesia. <laughs> North Korea was a tough place to yeah. get. Yeah, yeah, for sure. He keeps carrying bags for people to give him extra money. Yeah. <laughs> so, wow. I'll give you hundred bucks to carry this bag across the border. <laughs> so, well, Dennis Rodman, I met him in prison in North Korea. He got me out. So, yeah. good to go. You guys. All right. So, so, back to the truck. That's what we were talking about. So, uh, so okay. So we did oil, we oil system, uh, head studs, EGR cooler, and then to kind of. Uh, Fill out the rest of the, the recipe there. We did our uh, billet water pump, okay. uh, stock six liter, and even six four water pumps have a plastic impeller, you know, the, the propeller part of it. And sometimes those crack and see them create a little bit. So ours are uh, billet aluminum. Six four is even worse. They'll beat up the uh, they'll beat up the front cover there. Yeah. And then you got to essentially replace the whole front of that engine. Yeah, um, yeah. The front cover goes. So, yeah. That's so we, always fun. Yeah. So we make a, a billet aluminum and it. Blue anodized uh, water pump for those, and uh, the, we rarely uh, air, ever hear about a pump. You make, you make a pink one, though, too. We, do we still sell a pink one? <laughs> we had a limited run yeah. of pink ones, yeah, yeah, in honor of one of our employees, Pinky. Yeah. yeah. We sold those out pretty quick, actually. Wow, that's, that's pretty fun. good. Yeah, there we go. 
And then uh, the next step we did was the thick them, the fuel injection control module. Right. Uh, a lot of times in six liters, they need to output 48 to control the fuel injectors. Right? 48 volts. 48 volts. Yeah. And so a lot of times people see them starting to drop below 48 volts, you know. And so the well, one still run up to what 36? It, we'll run at 24. It depends. We had a customer. Hard starts and rough yeah, I know it doesn't run right. Yeah. You know, but I'm saying actually. We had a customer that came in one time. And he, he was told he needed injectors, and we checked it, and he had 16 volts. Oh my God. And we wow. started it up and drove it into the shop, and then we tested it again, and then it wouldn't restart uh, at 16 wow. or 15.8. So, yeah. and it ran like it needed injectors, and it didn't. We yeah. put a new FICOM on it and ran like a top, and got that as a new truck. So, right. yeah. Right. So with our power slide supplies, you can set the voltage at 48, but you can also set it at 53 or 58 volts. And so 53 is what I chose on, on my truck, just because I figured, hey, better safe than sorry. I don't really think a lot of extra voltage does a lot of good, but at 53 volts, I'm relatively sure it will never drop to 48. Well, when I was a, and correct me if I'm wrong, when I was a mechanic here, electronic, electronics is part of what my job was, and I will say I never did this, which is probably a lot. But if you couldn't find an electrical, couldn't figure out what was doing this small, tiny electrical issue, oftentimes you could throw a new battery at the vehicle and fix it. And it's because that extra voltage would kind of bypass uh, yeah. the issues. Uh, so is that is that maybe a quarter maybe, volt short or something? Uh, yeah, you know, that's um, an interesting question. So yeah. I can see well, how having higher voltage. Uh, tell me if this is one of the ideas behind it. Higher voltage could. I mean, that's not, but. You hit on something bigger that people will test their FICM voltage. We're like, okay, step one is test your battery voltage. Because right. it's the FICM is just a multiplier in effect. It takes 12 volts in and runs it through and spits out 48 on the other side. So if you got 11 or 12 volts getting to it, great. If you've got 6 volts getting to it, your FICM voltage is going to be low. And you say, oh, I need a new FICM. The voltage is too low. Well, it's a multiplier, so you got to check the source first. But yeah. I guess, I mean, and the FICM doesn't have to have 47 volts, it quits, and 48 it works. It's not a, it just runs better the more voltage it adds to a, to a certain extent. Well, and it's redundant, but bulletproof FICMs are redundant as well, right? Isn't there four power systems now as opposed to two? Well, well we still want a six phase as opposed to a four, yeah. Okay. With two extra transistors in there to help share the load. Yeah. So, and also, if they were to fail, you're still... You got backups. So you have backups, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I think more likely it's better to say that the le chances of one failing is lower because all of six of them are now working together, and so none of them have to work as hard. Right. So none right. of them are, it's like having a six cylinder engine instead of a four. You don't have to rev it up to 9,000 RPM to climb the hill, you can climb it at 6,000 RPM. Sharing the load. Yeah. Sharing the load. So everything runs a little cooler and better. We all know heat just kills electronics, so yeah. keeping it cooler is the best part. And that's why we get a new cover for it, too, that's yeah. got a lot of heat fins on it to dump the heat. And well, very thick lives. circuit board. And I mean, it lives on a valve cover. Yeah. yeah. It's bolted yeah. up to the valve cover with yeah. little rubber isolators. I mean, just, it just always amazed me that you're going to take a what's running the engine and bolting it up. Right? Correct. I mean, might as well bolt it up to the transmission or something like that. <laughs> I know, know just, seriously. Like, yeah. You're just beating it. It's not out of it. Bolt it to the front right caliper. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a smoother ride than what it gets. It gets yeah. shaken what a billion times a second up right. there. Right. Yeah, I don't know why they didn't do it on a fender well or something yeah. else, but maybe because the harness was, would be moving all the time with the motor mounts. Well, well speaking of fender well, you your Bronco in the uh, ECU in the fender oh, well. I remember that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You had I, a long I, travel Bronco that kept getting kissed by the tire. I had a long travel Bronco. I should have kept 35s on it but I put 37s on it and that tire I didn't have inner fender well so that tire would just kiss the ECU and knock a wire out and I remember I was never patient enough to try to figure out what was wrong so we'd be out somewhere and I'd be like oh we're getting into it home and then our pal Gusto would sit there for hours uh -huh. unplugging wires and plugging them in until he'd be like yes and then it would start up and I'd be like that's why we brought Gusto <laughs> yeah. 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 I still have Gusto's half inch socket in my Ranger Ocotillo, I remember yeah, that. I oh had my a, gosh. Uh, I had yeah, a cool tell, tell Gene about that. That's a good story. I we, were, hear it. we were out in Ocotillo, and I don't know, it was maybe five of us, five trucks just running through the canyons, I guess. Okay. Um, and my, my truck started overheating. So it stopped, pulled over. It was dry. Drained everything out of it. There was a plastic fitting. It's a 94 truck. Yeah. Plastic fitting in the uh, coolant system that degraded. I had nothing to put it back together. And it was just hose to hose, right? It was just yeah. hose to hose. Yeah. yeah, it was hose to hose with so a plastic fitting in the middle. With a coupling. Yeah. A coupling yeah. that went bad. It 
Goose, we're trying to find anything we possibly could to put it together just to get back to camp. Gusto had a, I think it was a half inch socket with like a 5 8 OD outside oh, wow. diameter. Shoved that in there in between it, two hose clamps on it. I, mean, I didn't have any water, we're pouring Gatorade, Sprite. Anybody got a pee? Yeah. yeah. I remember Whatever telling Gusto, do. you're not getting that socket back, Gusto. Yeah. <laughs> it's still there. And it's one of those things where I won't take it off because it's just lasted and worked that long. It's been fun. But well, maybe you're onto something. I mean, maybe we we'll start using sockets as couplers. Yeah, that's, that's a real cheap way of <laughs> using couplers. It's a $900. Well, I, I got a six-liter story to share that my brother and I, Ken, were working on his six-liter, his 04, and he was up over the cab and uh, up over the engine, I should say, and he was working on the little heat shields way at the back, and I hear a bunch of cuss words coming out, and I'm like, what's going on? And he goes, oh, I just dropped that 10-millimeter socket, I didn't hear it hit the ground, and I'm like, oh, all right, and he's looking and looking, and I go, well, am I going to drive that one home tonight? Yeah, yeah, it's okay, yeah, it'll probably be, ah, well, that socket's gone. Okay. So I get in the truck and I'm driving it home and I, I live in Phoenix and it was July so it was 197 degrees but it was late thank goodness. I get probably I drove about 30 miles and I'm no less than about a mile from my house and all of a sudden I get a I got a flat tire and it's going flat fast. You can hear so I pull over into a parking lot and by the time I can stop I'm on three wheels and that other one's just flat man and I'm a mile from my house and I'm tired it's eight o'clock at night and thank goodness the sun went down because if you ever try to change a tire in Phoenix and the asphalt the jack will just sink if it's because the asphalt just melts in that temperature had a rug get the tire down change it put it all together and lift up the spare throw it in the bed of the truck close it up and I go home I get back to work the next day and I grab my brother and go hey I got something for you he goes, what's that go put the tailgate down and puts it down and he goes you had a flat and I said yeah and look there's the socket. It had been bedded right in the right in the uh, the tread of the tire perfectly and let all the air out super fast. Because it's the hole all the yeah, way through. Right it's through. Yeah. I guess we could have used it as a coupler on the cooling hose sometime too. But it's just, yeah. I've never heard of a socket puncturing no. a tire. I've yeah. had a spark plug. Yeah. yeah. I had a spark plug going mine once, but never a uh, never a socket. There's a hole in the middle of the socket, so yeah. it's the perfect, perfect drain, drain the tire. It went flat good. in about 10 seconds. Yeah. And we still have that socket. It's still, oh, I'll put it back. It's still usable. Yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah. Put that on the wall of. Yeah, you know. it's part of the Hall of Fame at this point. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I got my own, my own box of Hall of Fame parts, things that stranded <laughs> me or almost killed me, sort of thing. <laughs> I was just surprised there was a Jeff and a long travel Bronco story, you know? I mean, yeah. that, those seemed like so rare. That thing always was. Well, it took perfect. me nine years. Yeah. And then, and then I finally sold it. When, yeah. it was, when it was completed, or almost completed, but oh well, it was fun. I learned a lot. It was great. It's funny how our, our lives have changed from wanting to be doing 90 miles an hour across the desert to uh, now I just want to be in the air conditioning and yeah. just sort of cruise around in the desert. You know, <laughs> just getting older. Look at those 20 somethings over there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, outside in the heat. Yeah. That's what I said with my 7.3 when I bought them. Like, I don't care if it's loud. I just want, you know, I want something loud and fast and. You know, now that I'm in the Beamer, it's like, no, I want something quiet and fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We do change. Fast, but it happens. Yeah. It definitely does. What's your guys' uh, plan for the rest of the day? Uh, we're going to go check out the rest of the show, see what else is out there, uh, see what our competition's doing. We there saw the go. whole thing in 20 minutes, right, Jeff? Yeah, I think we saw it all already, yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's just this little room right here, right? No, it, this it's just this booth. Okay. Uh, just uh, this it's booth. the only one that matters, yeah. actually. Yeah. That's why it's got a five-digit number, because it's the only booth here. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just the Diesel World booth. That's 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 it. You know, but we've got an interest in seeing what diesels are here, because we've expanded our product line from just Fords to now we're, we're supporting Cummins engines and Duramax and everything like that with ETR coolers. Nice. Uh, H-Core technology inside those. Yeah. So the uh, the Ram 67 one we recently released, and uh, that we expect some people to come knocking on our door for that one because apparently, with the current Cummins at 67,500 miles, there's an alarm that comes on in the dashboard. You're supposed to take it for a service, and part of the service includes taking off the EGR cooler and soaking it and cleaning it, you know, with the solution and all that. People don't want to do that. You know, people, yeah. people are calling it the, the 67,500 mile an hour, like, money grab. They have, right. like, nicknames for it. Right, you know, of course. Yeah. It's the same with my uh, my BMW. It's about 50,000 miles. you got to take the intake off yeah. and all that off and decarbonate. So we're, we're, we're attempting to show people, hey, there's an alternative to that. 
Yeah. Well, actually, when are you going to make one for the BMW? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Before you hit 50,000 miles, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. already there. Oh. Yeah. 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 So, so it's going to be fun to, to finally, because to me, Cummins people are, are just crazy nuts. Cummins. Fanatics. Fanatics, yeah. yeah. When I used to go to uh, the Diesel Power Challenge every year, I would always just marvel at how committed Cummins people were. They'll yeah. upgrade anything, even if they don't need it, just because it's an upgrade. Right. You know, they, like, oh, I need that one. That one's better. Yeah. And so uh, it's been a long time coming, but I'm really happy that, that, that we're supporting Cummins owners now. And, now you got to start selling the big C stickers because they all have to have that. <laughs> yeah, so, of course they do. You know. Of course. Yeah. I wonder if we could somehow work that into a bulletproof logo somehow. Oh, yeah. Without, you, without the Cummins lawyers coming after us. Yeah, oh, Good luck with that. Yeah. yeah. I know something about trademarks and uh, yeah. Yeah. So that means we're going to see Rams at Bulletproof now next time I go there. Different brands? No, Rams. Oh, Rams, yeah. yeah. Rams. We've, yeah. we've got employees that drive Ram yeah. uh, coming 6 7, yeah. yeah. And Duramax. At least a couple of Duramaxes rolling in every right. day, too. So, yeah. Um, so, we're, you know, we're, we're producing the EGR cooler for more than one version of that 6 6 Duramax. Sure. You know, the LBZ. Right. What is the LLY? Is that the market? LLY? Yeah. No. Yeah. So it was LLY. Sorry, excuse me. LB7, LLY, LBZ. LML, sorry, LMM, LML, L5P. See, and the most confusing <laughs> thing is they, they kept it all the same displacement. It's all 6.6. Six. Yeah. Yeah. At least Ford had had enough uh, banners to say, hey, six we'll, we'll change the displacement so you don't get them mixed up so easy. Yeah, see, and I actually, I actually am very happy with Ford went through so many different engines. And you know they didn't want to. No, I know they didn't yeah. want to. Well, yeah. four, so, right, since 2002. So the 7.3, yeah. 6 liter, 6.4, now the 6.7. Yeah. And they've stuck with the 6.7. It's a tremendous engine. I think it's a great engine. Yeah. I'm yeah. so happy that they finally stuck with something. I know they didn't want to. I know it was emissions reasons. It was all these other different things. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. 7.3, but, yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll go into the 6.0. Mm -hmm. um, all the rumors as to why they went to the 6.0 and saying that they knew it was going to be a problem. They knew it was going to be a problem. It needs to be ready, but it's not ready, but exactly. it needs to be, but it's not. Yeah. It's a sticky wicket for everybody. Nobody likes those situations. 6 4 was the band aid to get to the next one. Um, but Duramax, that bottom end for the most part, I'm going to get yelled at by so many people for saying this. <laughs> you get yelled for, at no matter what. Know, <laughs> for the most part, that rotating the, the, the block has been the same all the way through. The rotating mass. For the most part, have been the same. You know, they just. Wow change for injection. It's the same thing with Cummins. They've essentially stuck with this one thing, which has allowed the aftermarket to get behind it. Oh, that's a good point. And yeah. really push all these performance stuff. Well, you what Adam's saying is you can buy one set of pistons from your really old Cummins and put them on your new one, too. Essentially, right? Yeah. Oh, one thing that are... always struck me about built Duramax is, is when they go down a drag strip, they almost sound like a gas engine. Have you ever noticed that? More than a Cummins or a, or a power strip. They all have their own sound. Yeah, I guess but, yeah. depending on how it's built. Yeah, but I've, yeah. I always thought that, that Duramax has had almost a gas sound when they're built. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree with that. Totally depends on their build. They got a big uh, VGT. They, yeah. you know, they sound like a helicopter or turbine engine. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. Whereas the 6.0 sounds like Chewbacca. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. You, you, you could probably identify any light truck diesel just by the sound but at this point couldn't you you know what's funny is i used to be a lot better at it i, I think um when i got out of the sales and out of um, installing parts and all that stuff and more um more actually more so on the performance side because it does they change how they sound yeah the stuff. but yeah i can definitely tell it cummins between you know duramax and well, it sounds like a tractor it must be a cummins right yeah the new 6.7, yeah. uh, the Gene's got a 2018 that's so silent, it's just incredible. Yeah. Just power incredible. stroke, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 6.7 power stroke in his Ford. Now, when you sit in it, you could swear the truck was either off or you're not in a diesel. It's so quiet. It's, it's just so incredible. Nice. I've, got, we, I've got that one and I've got a Raptor, a 2017 Raptor, and I almost prefer to drive the power stroke. Wow. Yeah. These, it's so comfortable and so nice. It's, I mean, you want to get around somebody, you floor it and you go. It's not, a, it's not your grandpa's diesel. It is a fantastic... Power training. When uh, our buddy Jared Jones, when he got his, he showed me something I thought was interesting. He took a water bottle and he put it on the cab of the truck and the water was flat. Wow. It was perfectly yeah, still, no wow. ripples in it, it was just perfectly flat. And then he put it on the tire and it had ripples all through. Huh. And it was just, it kind of showed me the 
how well of a job they had done stabilizing that cap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know and then he I mean? drank the water bottle and it was vodka. Uh, well, probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah Did probably. You, didn't you get this from Jared, Jeff? Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I don't water know. Bottle, I'm afraid to taste it without a chaser. Yeah. yeah so we'll see what happens. Yeah, I hear you there. You know, I wouldn't be so, the least bit surprised if Jared Jones wanders across the, the, the set here and says, oh, hey, you guys. Yeah. He's around somewhere. I didn't know you were here. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> look, just look for a big Sasquatch looking dude. Yeah. Who hasn't had a shower in a day and a yeah. half. Yeah, that's Jared. Dragging his wrists on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah the so, girl's chasing him. So Jared, Mr. Offroad Jones, freelance. Uh, automotive journalist, you could say, mm -hmm. came into uh, Las Vegas for SEMA the day before yesterday, I believe. Or, no, he, oh, he, was last night. he left at 1 a.m. from Southern California. Uh, got Tuesday here, morning, right? Tuesday morning. Got here, didn't have a hotel room, so he brought his sleeping bag for his Durango. I don't know where he stayed last night, but I'm pretty sure he's staying at Myers tonight and tomorrow. Oh, God. So. <laughs> well, so everyone, so that everyone knows, um, Jeff actually hired me on my first media job. Gene, I've known from day one, then essentially. Yeah. Um, so we've, I, I would say, we're more buddies than anything else. Sure. Why we have all these weird we've Moab together. Yeah. yeah. We've all this inside it. stuff that no one else is going to be entertained by. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. You know, we got some good info on the 6.0. We got a lot of good stuff. We actually have a couple new products coming out for the 6.7 that I can't quite announce yet, but. We have some new products that we're very excited HR about. HR cooler. Uh, oh. Well, oh, oil cooler. Uh, something. Yeah, Jeff, yeah. Uh, so for document. anyone who is looking for a sales guy, Jeff apparently now needs a job. Uh -oh. Yeah, yeah, maybe so. Yeah. yeah. Uh -oh. He's good at carrying luggage, too. But uh, <laughs> if you just stay stay tuned with us and check us out. we got a lot of products coming out for him. We're just excited because cool stuff coming up. And those trucks, again, we just really are excited. On they, they work, and they work so well. Everything I've ever seen come out of your guys' shop is innovative, original, perfect. You know, I mean, it's, it's yeah, you guys you know, have some amazing stuff. So we get calls now for, from companies that we don't make products for. Nestle Foods was in contact and said, we have all these problematic trucks. Can you guys design a, an ETR cooler for them? Yeah, so, fleet service. So now, yeah, we're really getting into fleets and, and yeah. big fleets like LA County Fire, Cal Fire, and, right. and UPS. And, it allows you more areas to test and then for the pickup truck drivers they yeah. get to benefit off that as well so it's cool um, having people access us that way too you know some people say i had a pickup truck but i, I you know i drive a big international truck and I, right. I saw that you guys are making egr coolers for these now too i'm welcome yeah oh yeah. yeah one guy's like i have your egr cooler my boss called me up and said we need a new egr cooler for this other truck well i got these guys that bought this stuff from two years ago and it works great give them a call yeah. i think we sold them stuff that afternoon right so so we've had a couple of uh, hot sellers already in the fleet market, so that's a, that's a new horizon for us. And, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. No, that's real cool. Mm -hmm. um, now what, actually, just out of, the, when I was out there a year and a half ago, you guys had a new, um, what's the new, oh man, yellow machine you guys oh, have there. It's the, like the a vacuum oh, furnace. It's like vacuum a hyper furnace. chamber almost. It really does. If yeah. you get the bends, we can, yeah. That was pretty slick. So it brings it brings the parts down to a vacuum, heats them up, um, so that you can essentially weld your your parts together. It's brazing. The, it's brazing. Yeah. Yeah. So for the audience that maybe doesn't know, brazing is a way of fusing two different products together, and it's yeah. kind of like soldering, but at a much higher temperature. Right. And we put it in a vacuum, and we pull a vacuum because that helps evaporate any oils, any moisture, anything else that the technician sneezed on it when he was putting it together, it's any sterile. impurities that are there between the bulkhead, the tube, and that braze is going to make a flaw. Right. So we got to get that stuff away. So we put it under a vacuum and then we heat it up too. And if the braze melts at, you know, 1500 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever it is, we'll heat it up at 1400 for three or four hours under a vacuum so any moisture anything that evaporates and is gone yeah. any snot any whatever. oils whatever yeah. fingertips fingerprints that stuff is just gone fingertips fingertips well <laughs> these are technicians <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they uh with their own fingerprints anyway so yeah yes. so then we'll melt then then we'll pop it up to the right temperature for 10 minutes let the braise soak in and wick into between the two parts and then we peel it back down and it just makes a fantastic product when they come out they're you can agree with this, Jeff, that they're really shiny and new. It looks like something 
Apple would make or something. It looks beautiful. Yeah, Gene recently told me, hey, all the products we shoot for the website, let's make sure they get them right out of the brazier when they're looking good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah that's a good call. It that's just a, call. amazed me going to that, your guys' shop every single time I've gone with it, just the new technologies that are in there every time. The new, it's uh, I mean, it's yeah, that vacuum it. furnace really is something. It's got to be 10 feet tall. It's a big yellow cylinder capsule, I guess, because yeah. there's ends on both ends. But the, the part you don't see when you're there is there's a huge cooling tower for it outside. Right. So it's, I mean, it's twice as big as you think it is just by looking at it. The whole apparatus. What it takes to make that, yeah. to run it. It's much yeah. larger than you yeah. see it. But we wanted to make that investment because having those EGR coolers last is what we built our name on. And right. it's hard to be right. bulletproof diesel if your stuff breaks every six weeks, you know, if it's yeah. cheap China stuff. Exactly. And so we put our money where our mouth is and we invest our money where our name is. And that's what we've done with that. I don't think today we've even had any tube failures at all. Maybe. I, I, I don't think so. I don't think we have. Well, I, just, I just asked about it. It was hand welded before, wasn't it? They it used was. to be all hand welded. You can Once imagine how intensive that is, oh, welding yeah. all those little tubes in. Every single one of them. Yeah. yeah. So now the guys, you know, take a, a nickel solution, a brazen solution, and brush it on there, and right. they can load in 40 at a time into this vacuum for yeah. And so, I mean, you're taking what, an hour per EGR cooler of welding, if not two, and breaking it down to a fraction. Yeah. It still takes a while, but now it's a batch process, yeah. right? We can run it at night and start it at six o'clock at night and it's done in the morning and yeah. be more productive. Yeah. yeah. So if anyone ever wants to come see it, come by Bulletproof Diesel. I mean, we have a, we have a retail uh, storefront for people to come buy stuff and check stuff out. We love showing people around. We'll usually give people a, a t-shirt or something coming by. And they have a tank. And we have a tank. Yeah. Well, that's and they'll, true. they'll yeah. let you drive the tank around downtown Phoenix if you show up. <laughs> no problem. Anybody that shows up. <laughs> yep. Put that 50 million bucks in my bank account in the Bahamas yeah. and you can drive the tank yeah. anywhere you want. But every Friday when we put the tank away, we usually run over something. And so... Uh, yeah, got, this is really cool. We've got actually. a YouTube channel uh, called... Uh, uh, well, part of our channel. Uh, uh, things that annoy Ken get crushed by the tank, and so uh, we've we've crushed an awful lot of stuff because lots of stuff annoys Ken. Right. Yeah. And we've even crushed some stuff that doesn't annoy him. What yeah. was the uh, What was the most fun thing you crushed? Well, they crushed a Prius before I was there, oh, which I, I think that. takes the cake. Yeah. 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 You can't beat yeah. that. Uh, yeah. We've done some other fun stuff. Uh, we did a jet ski not too long ago. Nice. Uh, we had fun with a. Uh, uh, a refrigerator was pretty good. We put okay. a bunch of cheap beer in a refrigerator and there then ran, ran that yeah. over. Didn't we do a big screen TV too? Done some big screen TVs. One of the funniest ones was I just took a can, a big can from the grocery store of uh, sliced beets, because Ken hates beets. And we ran over it and what we didn't think of is when it punctured, it was just going to shoot a spray of beet juice everywhere. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so who got who got sprayed down? Uh, our, our, our camera woman for that day, Dina, who, who works Dina with us, got she got oh, sprayed. Man. But I remember looking in the air and it was just a fine pink mist <laughs> everywhere. And you were breathing it in your nose and everything. It was just beets. Yeah, so uh, I'm not doing that one again. Uh, well, no, you just find something else to do with it, you know? <laughs> so if anyone has ideas, email me at jeff at bulletproofdiesel.com. I'll do it. Yeah, we'll smash just about anything. We've yeah. done old toilets and such yep. that didn't work very well. Yeah, barbecue grills. Yeah. We did an, an old drum set that didn't work anymore. Nice. Uh, like anything nice. and everything. So that's what we do. Yeah. We'd like to have fun. Yeah. And it's a diesel engine in the in the Jeep or in right. the tank. So white diesel, isn't it? It's a what? White 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 diesel. What's the engine? It's a... I remember yeah. sitting. It in runs a multi fuel. Yeah. It's a Leland engine. Is the manufacturer. Leland. Okay. Uh, L60, I think it is, at least in 60. They actually will run on multiple fuels, but uh, yeah, that's a cool engine. Yeah. There's 12 pistons, but only six cylinders, so any of your fans out there trying to figure out that math. Yeah, it's opposing no, pistons. Yeah. yeah, well, you know that, but they do. Right. Now yeah, they well, do. It's essentially they're pushing, the pistons are pushing towards each other. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. It still that's sounds incredible. like, I mean, if I remember correctly, it still sounds like a normal diesel. Yeah, well, it's a two stroke. It's revved up, it sounds a little different. Yeah, and I think revved up is 800 RPM or something. It doesn't go real high, but yeah, it's a cool well, if it's, thing. If it's two-stroke, then is it um, compressed? I don't know. I don't know if there's... It's like the, the two-strokes that I grew up with, uh, 6V92 Detroits, you know, they had to have a supercharger on them to scavenge the air out of the cylinder yeah. for, for better running. Then they had a turbo for the high end. So it was essentially, it was a, not essentially, it was quite literally a super turbo. Super turbo. A super turbo diesel. Wow. Uh, but I would think that one would have to be compressed as well 
for efficiency's sake. It probably is, but I don't, yeah. I don't want to tell you yes or no. Right. Come on over. We'll do a Diesel World article on it. There you go. We'll climb Done. in that thing. We'll Done. run over something. Yeah. So, All right. Uh, that would be fun. It's a cool engine. I'll rent a car and I'll get the. Uh, <laughs> the I'll full get insurance. all the insurance. <laughs> You want the no fault walk away insurance for twelve dollars more? Here's twenty, yes. buddy. Hello, Enterprise. <laughs> I've got a flat car I need you to pick up. A flat tire? No, it's well, a flat car. At least a flat tire. Yeah. I was just driving. I don't know what happened. Yeah, I, don't know what happened. Yeah. Yeah. I parked in the McDonald's parking lot, came back, and just parked at this vendor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this customer of ours. Yeah, absolutely. So, Adam, what's new in the diesel world that we need to be looking at? Oh man. You know, it's it's grown so much in just the last few years. I mean, I'm a I'm a little more partial on the racing side, but it's it's kind of been amazing just to see how the performance of diesel engines has grown. So tell us about the years. the ultimate call out challenge. Should we be involved in that? Tell us about. It. Yeah, I think you guys should. I what mean, is it? Tell me about it. Uh, call out challenge mm -hmm. is. Um, so in 2016, um, James Brundle and I, James really had the idea, um, and then we both just sort of tweaked it to what it was, and we took it over right after that. But it's 32, I think is the number, back then it was 32, um, of the highest horsepower trucks in the country. Okay. The whole idea was everyone goes to all these events to... Um, they want to see things blow up. They want to see the, the best of the best. There's usually only two guys that are really you know, clear the stands and everyone goes over to the dyno to see him run. Or, you know, we wanted to collect all those guys okay. in one spot. An all-star sort of thing. Exactly. An all-star deal. That's what it is. Okay. So it happens in May in Indianapolis. Okay. Uh, it's three days long drag racing, sled polling, dyno. Um, and they're actually doing, last year was the first year for qualifiers, so instead of it being the top 32, now there's other people that can just enter and come in. If you get 700 horsepower higher kind of thing, you can qualify. Yeah, or? something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and they are trying to qualify for the next year. Okay. So there's, you'll have sled pull and dyno going on the same day. You'll have, actually it's not just take it back, sled pulls all one day. But you'll have drag and dyno going on one day, so you'll have the, the actual competitors dragging one day and the qualifiers dyno on the same day. So it's a ton of action. Going on uh, yeah. Um, is it worth you going? You know, I don't think it's worth anyone going to that. I mean, if you guys haven't gone out to it to see it, you should definitely at least it's go fun. out know, and see it. One thing I thought, you know, is most of our products are reliability based, and those guys are so custom that our products wouldn't even close to. But some of them might use our water pump or our 58 volt. Think about what they're towing to there. Great point. Yeah, they're all yeah, towing them. Yeah. Um, yeah, so then, and even every single person that goes to that show, they're not all hardcore racers. They just enjoy it. Yeah. You know? They don't have a hundred grand burning a hole in their pocket that they put into a truck, so. <laughs> it is, you know, in all honesty, I mean, it is a very affluent demo. It has to be to be able to... Uh, to enter, right? I mean, they... Well, do, I mean, just just outside the entries, yeah. Of course, the guys that are entering have to have some coin to be able to pull it off or be really creative to figure yeah. it out. But um, just everyone that's there, yeah, you've got to have some money to buy these $80,000 trucks. So. Yeah. And even if you're buying the cheaper ones, diesels aren't cheap to fix. Yeah, yeah. Oh gosh, no. They last forever, so you're, you know, probably recoup that, but uh, you still got to be prepared to spend three grand when you when something breaks. Well, that event sure grown in the last couple of years. Oh, incredible. It's yeah, yeah, you it's must amazing. you must be proud of it. Yeah, I, I am. I, it's not my event anymore. Yeah. You know, it was, um, but it's uh, it is very very cool to see how it's grown. Yeah, that's great. You know, a lot of people have. I've heard a lot of people come out and say that. UCC helped the industry grow as quick as it has in the last few years as far as performance. I don't know how true that is, but I'm sure it didn't hurt it. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's been fun to watch. That's great. That's great. It's been fun to watch. It's a little bit kind of like uh, you know, watching an ex-girlfriend succeed. <laughs> wish I was, wish I was uh, still more involved, but yeah, no, we, we still help out a lot. That's great. It's a fun event. That sounds cool. It sounds fun. I think it'd be interesting. And part of the idea is that you got to be reliable enough to do all three parts, not just specialized in. You have to do one. all three. 
Yeah. yeah. And part of the rules was there there are no rules. Oh. Other than safety. So yeah. guys can spray as much as they want. That's they can great. run whatever fuel they want. They can do whatever they want. They can swap engines out. Unlimited classes. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. Uh, two years ago, um, the Firepunk team, they took a sled pulling engine, a Sigma pump sled pulling engine. Just, I mean, it runs on compression so low that they have to use for like four cans yeah. of ether just to get it <laughs> to where it will run under diesel. Wow. Um, but they, they drag raced with their normal common rig. Pulled that out, pulled this mechanical engine in wow. the dyno, and then swapped it back out again for the sled pulls. Unbelievable. And it was just, you know, stuff like that. It's just amazing that's to see. Cool. You know. That's cool. That's a few late nights right there. Yeah. That's the, yeah. yeah that's, yeah. yeah. Two very late nights. Now, can they do that on the side of the trail in the Baja, you know, with <laughs> two headlamps <laughs> yeah. and, a, yep. and an 8-millimeter socket? Because that's what we get called to do sometimes, it seems like, you know. In the middle they, of nowhere. They probably could it would just be really tough and a lot of planning before I had to make that happen. Yeah, <laughs> that's fun. But that's great. Bringing a cherry picker out there with you. Yeah. Uh, it's an amazing sport. It's amazing what people will do with cars, trucks, yeah. and engines, you know. Yeah. And where they'll do it. Yeah. 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 It's been great talking with you guys. Yeah, thanks a lot, Adam. It's been great. Day. Yeah. It's been fun. We're going to go check out the rest of the show, see what else we can find. If, if we find something we really think you ought to see, we'll come back and oh, show Oh, definitely. Yeah. Please do. I'll, I'll get to wander a little, around a little bit later today I'll be like, tomorrow. Adam, this H2 has 32-inch wheels. You're going to oh, need to see it. yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Without jack support. <laughs> and it's got nine turbos. <laughs> and 12 CP3s. Well, thanks, Adam. Thanks, Diesel World. You guys do a lot for us. We yeah. appreciate hey, it. Hey, thank you. Yeah. All right. Good seeing thank you guys. Thank you, Adam. Always appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Yeah. Don't forget, diesel fans, if you're looking to build your truck, you have questions on upgrades, performance, any of those things, make sure you check out our sponsors. They're more than more than happy to chat with you guys, or you send them an email, and they can uh, help you that way. Until next time, keep the shiny side up.